Here we are today, June 4th, 2021. I'm George Grun at Grun Guitars, ready for our weekly question and answer session. As usual, we have plenty of questions. We're rarely at a loss for topics to discuss, but we welcome more questions. And even if questions come in during the course of the coming little over an hour, I'll do my best to tackle each and every one of them. Business has been good consistently this year. And as more and more people are traveling, it seems that a high percentage who go through Nashville are interested in stopping in to see what we and other dealers have available. But certainly the guitar market is remarkably resilient and healthy, with probably the biggest impediment for the moment being that so many manufacturers are backordered severely so that many dealers specializing in new instruments are having great difficulty keeping a good inventory in stock. And if they canceled orders during the pandemic, not knowing how long it would last, they are plumb out of luck now because now they can't replace them easily or they may have to wait a year. Uh, we are currently receiving many instruments that we ordered at the January NAM show of 2020. Uh, but very shortly after that, of course, everything shut down. So here we are already in June of 2021. And some of the instruments that we ordered at the NAM show in January of 2020 are arriving now. And we're glad we didn't cancel those orders. But the vintage instrument market is healthy and the new instrument and general used instrument market is also proving to be remarkably healthy with good, strong demand. And we are still getting some fun toys in. Like two things that just have come in recently that I'd like to show. One, a beautifully conditioned 1957 B28 Martin with magnificently figured Brazilian rosewood. This is rosewood that you don't see much anymore of this quality at any price on a new Brazilian rosewood guitar because even if they have stuff that is new old stock wood uh, it's been sitting there for years. There's not much of it that has grain that looks anything like this. And this is 1957. And it's in remarkable condition, including its original hard shell case. And something we don't often see on something of this age, but they kept their original receipt. And it's right there, dated in 1957. And uh, you'll note that uh, things were a relative bargain back then. Uh, they put $10 down and they made monthly payments of $10 a month. And the total was $300 with the original case, which was a very fine quality guide case, but Point is, back then it was pretty routine that people bought instruments on installment plans. And this guitar is clean, right down to the hard shell case and the original receipt. Even the receipt looks almost new. So there are still fun toys like that out there, although darn few from 57 that come in looking like that because essentially it looks like they didn't use it. Uh, but still, even this morning, just within the past hour, here's one that I just bought. This is a 1928 Gibson L1 
what a lot of people call the Robert Johnson model. This is the 13 and a half inch wide lower bout, 12 fret neck, and it is in fine cosmetic condition, although to be set up in playing order, it's going to end up needing a neck set and a bridge re-glue and uh, some work of that nature. But for 1928, fact is it's held up a whole lot better than people born in 1928 are holding up today. This guitar will run through our shop upstairs, get set up in good playing order, reset the neck and it will be a fine instrument. And it's also something that I find quite interesting because typically the 13 and a half inch wide early so-called Robert Johnson model uh, has a bracing, not X braced. This is as early an X braced Gibson as I've ever seen. So it is historically quite an interesting example. So in fact, I don't recall ever seeing another of this particular model that was X braced. So aside from the fact that it's a really interesting, nice guitar, it's also a good learning exercise for me to discover that by golly, they're not all A braced. There's an example of a very early X braced Gibson that I was not expecting it to be that way. I had seen photos of it previous to it being brought in today, but um, had never expected at all that it would be X braced, but that was made in 1928 and is a historically very interesting guitar as well as being a good instrument. So we have questions from our listeners. John Parsons asks, you have more sinker quadruple O Martins customs on the way soon. And the answer to that is yes. Uh, we ordered them in quantity and we have both 14 fret model quadruple O's measuring 16 inches wide with the sinker mahogany neck, neck block, in block, interior linings, back and sides. And sinker wood is from Belize in Central America. It was cut, uh, in, just floated down the river after being cut, but it was cut from between 1870 and 1920, so 100 to 150 years ago. And when they would float it down the river to the sawmill, about 30% of it would just disappear, it sank. And that being before the invention of sonar to find it or scuba gear to go after it makes that stuff very special today because underwater it is well preserved. It's in remarkably good condition, just needs to be dried out, which even if you cut a tree down as a live tree right now, uh, you don't just stick it in a kiln and have it ready in two weeks. Uh, that wood needs to be seasoned before it's gonna be structurally stable. This wood, once it's dried out, is stable and can be used very soon after being dried out and it's very slow grown, dense virgin forest wood that was in a dim setting and grew slowly. So it's denser and stronger than typical secondary growth wood. That's something true of spruce or numerous other species. Anything that's grown in a more open setting where it gets lots of light, plenty of moisture, grows easily and quickly uh, is not gonna be as good as trees that grew under greater stress and really had to struggle and grew more slowly. But uh, at any rate, the simple answer to the question was, are we getting more is yes. Um, we have a question from Paul. It says the attached photo, will be the attached photo. You note that it's an Epiphone rather than Gibson. Uh, and it has the early Epiphone inlay that we typically see on the Triumph model on the peg head, but it has a body shape like a Les Paul, except it's double cutaway. But it has two full-size humbuckers 
and for all practical purposes, looks like it should play very much like a Les Paul. And but this picture shows Robert Johnson, who was a player in Memphis. And he's still actively playing guitar today. But it says the attached photo appeared in the UK, in the UK guitar magazine back in the mid 1970s. It shows Memphis guitarist collector Robert Johnson holding what the magazine describes as a one-off prototype made by Gibson as a possible replacement for the Les Pauls when they were discontinued in 1960. The article goes on to describe the guitar as follows. It has a carved top like the Les Pauls and two Les Paul standard pickups, but it has two cutaways. Regrettably, it never went into production. Um, he further says, I've heard mention of this guitar since and wonder whether you have ever come across it. Was it indeed a Gibson built Epiphone prototype or a fake of some sort? Yes, I have seen the guitar. Um, I saw that guitar in the very early 1970s and there was a dealer in Memphis, Mike Ladd, who had a music store, Mike Ladd Music. And right around 1970, he went up from Memphis to Gibson in Kalamazoo and was shown and ended up purchasing a bunch of instruments, some of which were not even fully finished, uh, did not even have lacquer or pickups on them, and some which were fully finished. But what I was told at that time by Robert Johnson and by Mike Ladd as well, was that this was indeed a prototype that to the best of their knowledge was one of a kind. And he had quite a variety of interesting oddballs, which back in the very early 70s, most folks didn't know much about what to do with or how much they might be worth. But Ladd was certainly aware that they were interesting uh, he got them relatively cheap from Gibson. They didn't want them. They were just considered obsolete stuff that was sitting around collecting dust. So he got them for very little. But they are very interesting pieces that he got. And this was one of them. So again, there it is. And uh, so far as monetary value, darn it if I know, but it does look like something that would have been made very shortly after the Les Paul sunburst was discontinued and when Epiphones were still being made by Gibson in the Epiphone factory. So it never went into production. If it had, it certainly, I think, would be quite a valuable guitar. Uh, it's also interesting in that see here is it looks like it has a master volume control in addition to four volumes or two volumes and two tones, two volumes, two tones, three position toggle switch, but also it appears to have a master volume up here to an automatic bridge, stop tailpiece and two full size humbuckers, same fingerboard as a Les Paul standard, bound on the top. And at any rate, an interesting piece of the Epiphone peg head is early enough that it has the dove wing, very much like a Gibson peg head, a little different shape down here, but still um, that is an Epiphone peg head shape from their early period. In fact, some of the ones made even before Gibson was uh, involved in the acquisition of Epiphone. And Gibson was owned by CMI, Chicago Musical Instrument Company, which bought Epiphone back in 57 and CMI owned Gibson. And when they owned Epiphone, they wanted to have Gibson make guitars, which basically they didn't buy an Epiphone factory, but they did buy raw materials. They bought design, trademarks, patents. They bought some instruments and uh, some work in progress. So that guitar, is real. I have personally seen, I've held that guitar. I'm confident that uh, the story being told about it at that time 
is accurate. Uh, I don't know exactly where that guitar is right now, although it probably wouldn't be very hard to find out since Robert Johnson is still around and one could ask him. Um, Jeffrey says, legend has it that Stradivarius cut wood only in the winter so that most of the tree sap has returned to the roots. Moon spruce are trees harvested from the Italian Alps within the last quarter of a waning moon and the lessening magnetic pull of the moon allows the sap in the tree to rest. Stradivari's master uh, journals from 1700 show that he believed these two factors, winter harvesting and cutting during the waning moon, made the wood stiffer and more resistant to changes in atmospheric moisture, and hence the term moon, moon wood. Have you heard of this legend? If so, have you ever cross, come across a guitar on top of moon wood? Well, Larave is currently marketing guitars, which they are calling moon wood tops. And it is alpine spruce harvested under at least conditions uh, during the winter. It's, it's old growth wood that's very fine. Uh, so far as how much the magnetic pull of the moon, and I don't think it's magnetic pull anyway, it seems to me it would be gravitational pull. It's the gravitational pull of the moon that causes ocean tides. And uh, the ocean tides certainly show that the moon does have significant gravitational pull, not magnetic. It's a magnetic pull wouldn't make sap go up or down. Uh, and for that matter, the magnetic or would be gravitational pull um, cause it doesn't really make any sense to me. The waning moon, the phases of the moon are caused by the sunlight hitting the moon and that you have the phases of the moon from the new moon when it's dark to the full moon when it's fully lit but that has nothing to do with the positioning of the moon versus the earth. Um, as the earth rotates, one side of the earth is closer than the other to the moon and that produces daily tides. But the phases of the moon would not impact either the magnetic or the gravitational pull of the moon and the earth rotates daily, constantly. It takes 24 hours to rotate. And uh, so the whole thing about the moon wood, to me, makes no sense. Uh, it is illogical. So far as cutting wood during the winter when the sap is down, yes, that makes logical sense. And that that is something that is worth doing. But so far as the phases of the moon impacting the gravitational um, stresses that would cause sap to go up and down in the winter, the sap is down. So nothing about that interesting legend perhaps of the 1700s when it was not understood what was going on, but alpine spruce grown in a harsh, cold environment for much of the year grows slowly. It's great stuff, it's fine quality wood. And if it's harvested in the winter when the sap is down, that's the best. So with tropical hardwoods, that's not an option because if it's in a rainforest, then the wood is going to have sap in it. Uh, now, many areas of the tropics have a wet season and a dry season, and it can make a difference whether the wood is cut in the wet season versus the dry season. And it would, in general, be preferable to cut wood in the tropics 
where there is a dry season to do it in the dry season, there would be less sap. And sap is definitely going to have an impact on the wood. So that would make sense, but uh, the whole thing about moon wood and phases of the moon, I don't buy it. Um, Pete, I may have the opportunity to purchase a 1930s Martin arch top with a round sound hole. And then he says in parentheses, L5 question mark. And no, it wouldn't be an L5 because L5 is a Gibson model, but Martin did make arch top round hole guitars from uh, the late, that 1931 through actually uh, early 33, uh, Martin made arch top round hole guitars. And then the same models were continued as F hole guitars from 33 through 42. Um, he says, not having seen or played the instrument, I know the owner is taking good care of it, but of course won't buy it sight unseen. Wondering what I can expect from it for sound and playability and what should I look for to help determine its state, what is the most common problem with them? Uh, well, looking at any vintage guitar, you know, one should always check structural stability as well as originality. Uh, and regardless of whether it's an arch top or a flat top, you're gonna to wanna to look to see, that, is it fully original or has it been modified? And there's so many different ways in which one can be modified that I can't tell you in the space of a few minutes, everything possible to look for. But clearly we want to know if it has been reworked or not. If it has not been reworked, we still want to know structurally, is it stable? And does it have any problems that have occurred over time due to the fact that it's had strings on it for however many years this instrument may be old, uh, you, know, you could easily have an instrument that may be 50 or even 100 years old, during which time things shift. Just like that L1 that I picked up and showed earlier this morning, um, that guitar will need a neck set and it will need the bridge to be re-glued. And that's not a kiss of death. That's things that can be done where it turns out just fine. But some instruments may have severe warps and uh, if it, the bridge coming loose and they didn't loosen the strings, it could have torn wood out of the top or if the braces came loose, it could have warped the top to make it for a very, very difficult restoration later. So some things are normally expected on a guitar that's pre-World War II or even from 1970. These days, 1970 was 51 years ago, 51 and a half years ago right now for the start of 1970 when I opened up my shop. Well, guitars made then often enough have problems, neck set angles, braces, bridge regluing. Sometimes binding shrinkage, sometimes pit guards that have deteriorated or bindings that have deteriorated. So there's all kinds of things to check for. But the point is, we do not assume when a guitar is 50 or more years old that it needs no work, even if it looks cosmetically fine. But on Martin arch tops, they're pretty sturdy. The top is thicker than on a flat top guitar, so it's less likely to be warped. Also, on an arch top, the bridge is movable and the pressure is downward on the bridge, whereas on a flat top, the bridge is being pulled up because the strings go through the top. But on an arch top, I just happen to have an arch top Martin right in easy reach. Let me just reach over and get it. So just, as we're talking about one, here be one. This is a 1935 style 
F7, and as you can see, it's an arch top with F holes. And they made earlier arch tops, Martins, with a round hole. The F7 never was made with a round hole because it wasn't introduced until 1935. And the round hole arch top Martins were from 31 through early 33. But as you can see, it's an arch top, and the top is arched so you can see it. it it's prominently arched and the bridge therefore is sitting higher than the level of the binding because that top lifts up because it's arched and then the bridge is high and there's a goodly bit of downward tension on the bridge, but it's not strong like a flat top guitar. On a flat top guitar, so it's just a 57 D28 that I showed you. The note, the, Top does not have it's just the barest, slightest bit of arch, which is deliberate because if you make it absolutely flat, then it has no room to flex up and down with changes in humidity. If it gets dry, it will simply crack. But the top is relatively flat, almost flat, which is the slightest of little arch. And the bridge is glued to the top. The strings run through the bridge. And therefore, they're pulling upwards so that there's upward to the pull, torquing that top. There's no such torquing of the top on an arch top. The pressure on the bridge on an arch top is straight down, but the pressure on the bridge on a flat top is torquing up. So, on flat top guitars, you have to watch to make sure that the top is stable. And again, if it's pulling up, that doesn't mean it's not repairable, but at least you should be aware that repairs will be needed in many cases. Martin arch tops are generally pretty sturdy. So far as what can you expect that the sound on a flat top versus arch top Martin, they're very different. And the arch top Martins uh, were not commercially highly successful in their day. They wanted to compete with Gibson and Epiphone as well as Angelico and Stromberg arch tops. But those have carved top and carved back. They have an elevated fingerboard, um, which can compensate the next set angle. So it's not as st steep an angle as on the arch top Martin. So the arch top Martins have a very steep next set angle. And in general, they do not have the power of a Martin flat top, nor do they have the power of a good Gibson or Epiphone arch top. So they were not highly successful when new. They do have good tone, but it's a different tone that most of the jazz players were not really looking for. And that frankly, most of the flat top players weren't looking for either. So they just never really hit their stride as a highly marketable item when new, but they certainly are collectible today. Um, but also, uh, if you're buying something sight unseen, it says, I know the owner is taking good care of it, but of course won't buy sight unseen. Yeah, sight unseen is a problem, uh, unless of course you're getting good photos and have approval privileges which dealers such as us do. And we're certainly not alone in that respect. Almost every reputable dealer of vintage and used instruments does offer approval. They may differ in some respects on their approval policy, how long they let you try it out. But uh, we don't expect people to pay thousands of dollars for an instrument that they've never seen, never heard, and have to commit unconditionally without having played it. Because I can assure you that often enough, they are not quite as represented. Uh, even in the case of the very nice, interesting L1 that I just bought this morning, um, it was not in the description that I was told to expect. It looked great in the photos, but uh, I was told it was set up in good playing order. And the fact is, no, it isn't. It's going to take over $1,500 of work, in fact, closer to 2,000 plus to put it in the condition 
that I would like so far as making it eminently playable, but everything it needs is absolutely doable where it will come out perfect. But it requires a fair amount of disassembly, reassembly, and when we're done with it, it will look virtually untouched. It will play great. It will sound great. It will be wonderful. It will be collectible. But it's still a lot of work. And if you yourself are not skilled at doing that kind of work and don't know who to take it to, it's important to take it to somebody who is truly skilled, knowledgeable, and has integrity to do that kind of restoration work. Because if it's done poorly, not only will it cost you money to have the work done, but they will have devalued rather than improved the instrument if it's not done well. They can ruin it. We spend, <clears throat> sometimes I think at least close to 50% of our time in repairs upstairs is undoing previous botched work that was done by amateurs or people who may have even had hung out their shingle and said that, yep, they're a pro at this, when in fact their work would not pass our standards. So there are some very good ones out there, but. Uh, Guitar repair people are not all equal. Um, John C. says, watching the video view and your prized Lloyd Lore signed L5, it appears that the finish has no checking, which is that correct? And if so, are there certain conditions for storing vintage nitrocellulose lacquer finished guitars that would inhibit or retard the process of finish checking? Well, Looking at it on screen, I don't believe you'd see any finish checking on that guitar. Uh, also, it's a varnish finish rather than a nitro lacquer finish on a lower. And it doesn't check the way lacquer does, but it still does, if you look at it really close, have a little network of very, very fine lines that uh, it's like looking at the surface of a really old painting. Uh, there is some finish checking, but it is minor. And uh, it certainly, if anything, it only just adds to the general patina and look of the guitar. It's gorgeous. It's not scratched up. It's in excellent condition. I find that guitar a joy to play and I'm very pleased to own it. I would say I'm pleased to be its custodian because I'll be 76 in August and with proper care that guitar is going to outlast me, my children, my grandchildren, and probably my great-grandchildren. Uh, I don't have any great-grandchildren yet, but then the point is with proper care there's no reason why that guitar can't last two or three more centuries. So Proper humidity is critically important. Between 40 and 50% is good. Uh, temperature control is certainly, it can survive happily in temperatures that go lower than your comfort level. And for example, the guitar is perfectly happy, probably at 55 degrees, which uh, if you are at 55 degrees, and you don't have warm clothing on, you're going to be very uncomfortable. The guitar is perfectly comfortable in a wider range of temperatures than we are, but really high temperatures are bad for guitars. And very low humidity or very high humidity is also bad for guitars. But in general, between 40 and 50% humidity and temperatures at which you yourself don't feel at all stressed. So I would suggest temperatures below 80 and preferably ideal temperature range is probably 60 to 70, but certainly 75 shouldn't hurt it. But uh, in the winter time, when you're running heat, uh, if it's really cold outside, the humidity indoors is likely to be very low. 
And in the summer, when you're running air conditioning, even though the air conditioning takes a good bit of humidity out, if you're in the south, the, um, that's going to really get it rather still damper than maybe ideal. If it's here, if it's 90% humidity outside, the air conditioning is not likely to get it down to ideal humidity. So you may need dehumidification in the summer. But if you're in Arizona or Colorado, where it's very dry, in the summer you're running air conditioning and air conditioning tends to take what little moisture there is out of the air. So it can be too dry. It depends on where you live and what time of year it is. But temperature and humidity control is important. Um, and not for, just for finish checking, but just for general health of the wood as well as the finish and for the guitars to be consistently set up in good playing order. Um, you don't want things to be moving around and you certainly don't want wood to either expand or contract dramatically with changes in humidity. And um, that potential is most certainly there if they don't receive the proper environment. Howard says, what makes a 12 fret guitar different or special from the rest? How is the Martin 12 fret quadruplo special? It's intonation question mark. Well, being 12 fret versus 14 fret has nothing to do with intonation. Quadruple of them. And uh, as you can see, the um, body joins, the neck joins the body at the 14th fret. The scale from the nut to the bridge saddle is 25.4 inches. And the body is this shape. Now, if you get the 12 fret model. Here be a 12 fret quadruple O. It has a slotted peg head, which has nothing necessarily to do with the scale, or you, you can make a 12 fret guitar with a solid peg head or a slotted peg head. There have been some guitars made with a 14 fret neck and a slotted peg head, but usually the slotted peg head is traditional on 12 fret. But as you can see, this body joins at the 12th fret, whereas the other one joined at the 14th. This body is actually two frets longer. The bridge position with respect to the end of the guitar here is the same. And the lower bow is essentially the same on the 14th fret and 12th fret mark. But the upper bow here is two frets longer which also gives it this more sloped shoulder rather than squared off shape as you just lop it off two frets, you end up with the body shape very much of the other one. So the Martin 12 fret guitar has a longer body, hence a slightly larger air chamber, and it puts the bridge in a different spot with respect to the length of the sound chamber. This is more air chamber above the bridge on this one than there is on the 14 fret model and that does cause it to resonate somewhat differently. In general, the 12 fret models have a bit more sustain and at least in the case of Martin's also can be a bit louder but um, there's fewer frets that you can reach but on the other hand the 12 fret model is uh, not something that's less traditional. In fact, if anything, it's more traditional. Well, all the Martin guitars that were made prior to late 1929, when they introduced the OM orchestra model were 12 fret. And 
classical and flamenco guitars, Spanish design, are traditionally also 12 fret. And by 12 fret, we don't mean there's only 12 frets in the fingerboard. It joins the body at the 12th fret versus the 14th fret on many of the modern guitars. But the, the 12 fret design is therefore earlier. But uh, in the case of Martin, most of their models, single O, double O, triple O, and D, as well as their smaller sizes, uh, smaller than single O, had 12 fret predecessors. So that is something that um, is, is traditional uh, so far as, again, it has nothing to do with the intonation. The intonation should be exactly the same because uh, the scale length on the ones we are doing on our custom order instruments are all 25.4. Uh, Martin did have some models that were 24.9. Uh, again, there are, and that scale is also used on 12 fret and 14 fret instruments, but it still has nothing to do with the uh, intonation of the guitar. Uh, as far as playability, most of the 12 fretters have a slightly wider neck. That's a sort of traditional thing, but on a lot of the custom ones that we're doing, they're one and three quarters at the nut for 12 fret and 14 fret. Although on our 12 fret quadruple sinkers, we are doing those one and 11, uh, one, excuse me, one and 13 sixteenths inches wide at the nut versus one and three quarters on the 14 fret model. The early Martins, uh, the ones made in the 1920s and some into the 30s had 12 fret necks. And even some like the S models they made in the 60s and 70s onward, uh, many of those have one and seven eighths at the nut. But again, that nut width is a matter of personal preference and as far as whatever the company, the manufacturer decided to do on a certain model. But um, that's um, basically answers that question. He has another question though. What makes new Martin guitars smell so good, especially if you leave them in the case for a while? Well, I think the clue might be there, especially if you leave them in the case for a while. Uh, some of them, the cases have an odor and it can, depending on the type of glue used, be anywhere from very pleasant to nauseating. Uh, but cases, are built, at least the traditional design cases, with uh, laminated wood that's bent and then leatherette or other covering on the outside and plush linings on the inside and all that's done glued in. So it's glue for the laminations of the case, it's glue holding the exterior covering of the case to the case and it's glue that's holding any of these linings in place as well. And depending on the type of glue, that can have an odor, and that odor can also get into the guitar. Uh, now, guitars themselves can have an odor from the wood, the glue, and the finish. And different finishes have different odor, ranging from virtually none to sometimes pretty pungent but varnish, lacquer, polyurethane, they don't smell the same. And hide glue versus some of the modern aliphatic resins or whatever, they're, they're not the same. They smell different. And different species of wood also can have a distinct odor, such as cedar, obviously has a rather aromatic odor. Uh, the so-called Spanish cedar, which is actually a tropical wood that's closely related to mahogany, has an odor that's very similar to cedar. So it's called Spanish cedar, but it really isn't a true cedar. Uh, but again, a lot of Spanish classical guitars that have Spanish cedar necks uh, with a Spanish design 
heel that neck extends into the body and uh, that has a strong odor which can be quite pleasant it's like opening up a cedar chest some people wanted their closets lined in cedar in the old days kept some of the moths out but uh, the point is the wood itself can have an odor the finishes have odor the glues have odor and depending on the materials the odor can be very pleasant or in some cases not so but um, basically covers that question uh karsten has a question are you aware of people finding old body blanks from major usa guitar manufacturers would you say this was a rare occurrence i saw a photo of one and wondered if it was genuine well he sent us the photos which do raise some questions in my mind one i've been to the gibson factory and i didn't see any wood that was stamped with the company name on it um of course that doesn't mean that they couldn't have done something in the past that i didn't see gibson's been in business they were incorporated in 1902 and i wasn't born until 1945 but i didn't really start studying guitars until my freshman year of college uh, but he sent some pictures and i'll hold them up and we can see here's a piece of wood and you can see there seems to be a gibson logo on it which looks like the old pre-world war ii style script gibson logo it's just a big slab of wood which is not really a body blank for anything because in the old days uh, they weren't doing solid body guitars but they might have had big pieces of wood that were cut down but this wood has a date stamp on it October 58. Well, in October 58, they weren't using that old script logo anymore. That logo hadn't been used since about early 47. So one wonders what's going on. And uh, we haven't seen any examples such as this before. So it leads us to really wonder what's going on here. Uh, I don't have a clear answer for it, but uh, basically for Joe Spann, uh, I had him look at it. Joe Spann wrote a very definitive book on Gibson history, very carefully researched. He spent over 40 years researching Gibson history and his research is ongoing today. He ain't done yet. And he made the comment, uh, what he sent his comment, I've never seen anything like this. Why would Gibson ink stamp a date on a piece of rough lumber? We've never seen that. And if it was from 1958, why would it be ink stamped with the old script style logo? And then the Latin phrase, copy at emptor, which means buyer beware. Uh, so we don't know, but the other point is that's not a body blank. It's not cut in the shape of a body. So it doesn't look like wood that have been, would have been used to make bodies out of. Um, but certainly Gibson and Martin did buy wood in bulk and uh, they were resawing some. Many makers today aren't even running them at their own sawmill operation, but Martin still has a significant milling operation. And Gibson certainly does cut some wood. Uh, but uh, again, it's uh, a situation where if you had the wood, what would you do with it? And do I trust those stamps on that piece of wood? Not really. But if it's good quality wood, would you would it have extra value because it's stamped with the Gibson name on it? Well, if you use it to make something out of it, 
then you don't see the stamps on it anymore. And if you don't use it for anything, then uh, what are you gonna do? Make a tabletop out of it? Or just have it as a conversation piece? Uh, does it add a great deal of value? All of that's highly questionable. Uh, but does it have much utility, extra added value because it has a Gibson stamp on it? I think its value is whatever it's worth to use it. And in that, and if you do use it, uh, the date stamp and the Gibson stamp will be gone. But again, why did they use that stamp on an October 58th date? And why would they even, I could understand dating a piece of wood just so you'd know how many years you've been seasoning it, how long you've had it. That would make some sense, but to put the name Gibson on it doesn't, you know, it's not like Gibson was selling wood, they were buying wood. And uh, if somebody stole a piece, uh, they couldn't necessarily identify it from the stamp on the wood because somebody stole it. All they'd have to do is just sand the name off and nobody would be the wiser. So nothing about it really adds up to be logical to me. But I've never heard of Martin stamping their name on wood. I've never heard of Fender doing it. And this is the first I've heard of Gibson doing it and I don't trust it. And even if they did it, it's not logical. Um, Tanner Oakley asks, how do you feel about the 2013 J35 remake Gibson? Um, uh, my recollection of it is when they did it back then, it was a rather nice guitar, but it cost an awful lot of money. Uh, it cost every bit as much at that time uh, as the uh, Martin D18 vintage reissue and uh, J35 when new cost half as much as a Martin D18. And uh, the workmanship on them was not equivalent to a Martin D18. So uh, when they made the first reissue that I've seen of a J35, uh, that's back when Henry Juskowitz was the president of Gibson and he's the one who mandated that it would have a very high price. Uh, I knew the luthier at Gibson who had designed the model and he was rather shocked at how much Henry priced it at. He thought that would kill sales. And we don't see very many of those. Now Gibson is doing some flat tops now that are pretty nice and are actually more sensibly priced. So uh, Gibson's current management uh, has been trying to make some good sounding flat tops for prices that are actually logical. Um, Richard H. Buse says, I've seen so many 2000s Martins with loose binding issues at the waist. What caused this obvious problem? And uh, basically it's gonna likely get down to two issues. One, uh, they don't make their own binding material, plastics, they buy it. And depending on uh, who's making it, the chemical composition of that plastic can vary. Some makers change the formula, especially on things like ivoroid, the imitation ivory bindings. Uh, they're flammable and some of the production techniques in making it are carcinogenic and it becomes a problem with even transporting it. It requires special shipping permits to send it so they're looking for other formulas and some of these formulas when they try them turns out that they shrink a bit. And if you're trying out a new formula binding that you think according to the manufacturer at least you're told it's great and won't cause any trouble it may turn out that they just weren't so sure about that. It's one reason why you see a lot of crumbling bindings on instruments made in the 1960s. Gretsch bindings and even earlier on some of the Angelicos and Strombergs, they had plastics that just deteriorated. They didn't know these were new products they thought would be very chemically stable and it would last darn near forever. And it turns out, nope, not really. Some of these things shrink. Martin pit guards also used to be glued direct to the top. 
and the nitrocellulose formula would shrink and could cause cracks in the top because if it was firmly glued to the top before lacquering, then that glue bond on pit guard to the top was very, very strong. If the glue had no give to it, and the plastic shrinks, something's got to give. Either the top's going to crack or the plastic's going to crack. And it turns out that in the case of the pit guards, they were stronger and had more pull than the top could handle. And often enough, it would crack the top on either side of the pit guard. Uh, but at any rate, why does the binding shrink? One, it can be the composition of the binding. And two, it can be also the interaction of the binding and whatever kind of glue they use to adhere it. If they use a glue that chemically interacts with the binding, some of those things can result in problems. So it's a, it's a matter of the type of glue you use, chemical composition of the binding, and sometimes the chemical interactions between the glue and the binding, and also as to whether it adheres well to wood. Some glues work great on plastics, but don't really adhere plastic very well to wood. And if they try out some new ideas, then there's uh, sometimes problems. And Martin did have some problems. They did cover it under warranty. I'm not seeing very many problems in that regard now. But uh, in general, the quality of ivoroid available today is not equivalent to the kind of ivoroid that was made during the 1920s and 30s. And some of that can be problematic. Uh, Dave Schmidt asks, did the sinker wood sink because of heavy mineral content? Uh, and the answer to that, I think, is actually no. Um, some of the heaviest pieces did sink, but it was generally, if they were in the water too long and got waterlogged, they could sink. And that's true of mahogany and numerous other woods. But, uh, there's sinker wood in the Great Lakes, particularly in Lake Superior. And uh, sometimes in storms, the wood uh, could fall overboard <laughs> on a ship and some of that, when it was in the water long enough, sank to the bottom. And Lake Superior is very deep and at the lower levels, there's no oxygen down there. And that would be preserved sometimes for literally hundreds of years, um, even more stable than the conditions for the sinker wood in Central America. Uh, but the sinker wood that we're seeing from Central America did not sink simply because it was very, very high mineral content. In fact, sinker wood, while it's dense and strong, is still not so dense that it wouldn't float. It's not like it falls overboard and just goes straight to the bottom right away. It's if things get in the water too long and a piece just doesn't, it's in a log jam. Uh, if it's just if they don't have the manpower to get that wood in and out quick enough, stuff sinks. And uh, when dried out, the sinker mahogany on the guitars we have typically is a little bit heavier than regular mahogany, but the grain pattern is quite different. And that's not because it sank, that's because it's old growth wood. So much of what we're seeing is really a result of old growth versus modern wood rather than simply so much mineral content. But the fact is, it is true that some pieces of wood, depending on the environment and soil conditions, have much greater mineral content. So you can have the same exact species of tree. And depending on the growing conditions, how much light it has, what kind of soil it's in, how rich the soil is, the temperature, the length of the growing season, it can vary in weight almost as much as 50% from one piece to another. Uh, but growing in the same plot, it's likely to be similar to each other, but the same species of tree grown in one latitude or one forest versus another where the 
climate conditions are quite different. The amount of rainfall is different. The temperature is different. There's, there's more seasonal variation in temperature. Uh, this has profound impact on the wood. And so some has a considerable mineral content and others much, much less so. In general, wood with a lot of mineral content, at least for backs and sides, works just fine. It's the backs and sides, and I have sides primarily as a spacer, they don't contribute as much to sound as the back does, which is the back is a sound reflector. And, uh, but there is vibration as well as reflecting going on. And the different types of wood do give very different sound. Um, and what I can say there is that uh, in general, rosewood has a deeper, darker tone than mahogany. And mahogany is more mid-range. Koa has a sound that is a little bit somewhere between sound of maple and mahogany. Maple's a rather bright sounding wood. But these are generalizations. I played guitars with maple back and sides that I thought had great depth and power and dynamic range that were remarkably good. And uh, I had one that came recently in that uh, been a real surprise to me, and that is a walnut guitar. And I'll get it down. This is a guitar that just came in a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, but this is a model that was made for the Winter NAM show in 2016. And it's a OM Vine. And, uh, style, and it's, this is number 13 of 35. There's a label signed by C.F. Martin IV inside the body. And uh, the inlay is engraved aluminum. But as you can see, the neck is walnut. This is a nice grain. And the back, and the sides, and the top are all walnut with quite attractive grain, ebony fingerboard and bridge. And I truly didn't expect this to be a great sounding guitar, but I was quite amazed. This, this guitar sounds really good. Anyway, surprise, surprise, it's good. And, um, it's not better than rosewood and mahogany, but it's on up there. It's a quite remarkably good sounding guitar and has good volume, good dynamic range. I'm quite pleased with how it is. It's a learning experience. Again, I never expected that English walnut would give that kind of sound, but it absolutely does. Um, John Contos says, hi, George, what are your thoughts on bridge and or bridge plate replacements on pre-1944 Martins? They definitely have an effect on price, but what about the effect on tone, assuming the repair work is top notch? Well, there's a bunch of people who seem to think that if you replace a bridge plate, that the guitar is just ruined. I do not agree with them. But not all repairmen are equal. If it's done well, to proper spec, if the bridge plate was damaged such that uh, it is well cracked or warped, there are times when it makes good sense to replace the bridge plate. If it's just worn from the ball ends of the strings, normally you can graft in some plugs and that works just fine. But if the plate has a lengthwise crack or is severely warped, uh, it makes sense to replace the bridge plate 
we have done plenty of grid play replacements, and if we thought that they did nothing but diminish value, we would not do that. But we're not replacing perfectly good grid plates. They have to be severely damaged if we want, if we're going to do that. And often the bridge plates that we replace are replacements that somebody else has put in and not done well. Uh, the original bridge plates were tucked into the bracing. And when that's not done, it will impact the sound. It still may be quite good, but it's not the way Martin did it. It's best to do a replacement that looks and functions like the original. But you know, we frequently enough get questions about how much is it going to diminish the value of my guitar if I have it refretted? Well, if it has original frets, but they're worn out, they're not original specs, and you can't make it playable if they're worn too far. You can dress frets up to a point, but if they're too far gone, we replace frets. And when we do it, we do it very well. And we use fret wire that is equivalent to what they used in new. If it's just that you happen to prefer jumbo frets and your guitar has medium sized or smaller frets and you want to change it just to make the guitar suit you better, in all probability, that is going to alter the value of the guitar if it is a really collectible, historically significant instrument. We don't feel that that is a good idea to do. And uh, it's, um, we just feel that while you may own an instrument after buying it, you are, in fact, its custodian. And with good care, it can outlast you and your great great grandchildren. I have Martins going back to 1836 that are still playable. We've had to do some restoration to get that to happen, but still, we've had some that are well over 100 years old, need nothing but a set of strings. We have a 1902 Martin 0042 that looks virtually new and it's very playable. It's a designed for gut strings. We have it strung up with classical strings, nylon, but it's eminently playable and it's in excellent condition. And we're not trying to rebrace it or set it up to be a steel string guitar. It may be that we prefer a steel string, but that doesn't mean you need to take that one and convert it. In general, if an instrument doesn't suit you, but it has original specs and it's in good condition, it would be far better to go buy another one that does suit you and leave this one original because it's the, the number of true fine condition original instruments is increasingly less and less per year. And from a monetary point of view, it doesn't make sense to convert it or change it because you will reduce its value. I remember one time seeing a Firebird 5 Gibson original reverse body model from 64 it's quite a collectible guitar, but there's a Firebird 5, and the owner had taken off the vibrato and put on a stop tailpiece with big quarter inch holes to mount the tailpiece and leaving screw holes from the other. And I said, you know, it would have been worth a whole lot more if you'd left it alone. Oh, but I had to do it. I couldn't play it any other way. Well, no, he didn't have to do it. He did it, but he took a guitar that would have been worth $15,000 or more, and he turned it into one that's worth 5,000. And uh, if he wanted, you know, he, he could have sold it, gotten 15, and went out and bought a guitar that would suit him just fine for probably $2,500. Uh, he wasn't a great player. But the point is, no, he didn't have to do it, and you don't always have to make it set up to play your style. Some instruments aren't intended for that. And some instruments, if they're museum piece quality, you don't want to modify it. But if it's simply a matter of investment, even it's not that he was so fond of the Firebird sound, he just had that guitar. He didn't want to pay the money to go out and buy another guitar, so he modified that one. 
but uh, we see usually the reverse. They get a guitar that is not in trim and they put a big Bigsby tailpiece or other vibrato system on it and put in extra screw holes and royally screw up a guitar doing that. The point is, there's some things you should not do to a vintage collectible guitar and extensive modification is such an item. It's something we don't recommend doing. Um, Jack Frost says, I recently purchased a Kalamazoo Oreo large top, which I really like. What's your opinion on the Oreo flat top and mandolin? Thanks. Well, Oreo was a brand name used by Gibson on some student model guitars. Uh, they're basically very similar to the Kalamazoo, or actually some of them are Kalamazoo Oreo models. So they have the name Kalamazoo on the peg head and a little decal of an Oreo bird, the Baltimore Oreo is a type of bird that they have on the decal. And so it's, it has that, that decal, it says Oreo. It's also Kalamazoo brand made by Gibson. And there's some of the nicer Kalamazoo's, but they were still cheap guitars when new. They do not have an adjustable rod in the neck. Um, some of them do have uh, X bracing, but most are the latter braces. Uh, the arch top does have uh, standard enough uh, parallel tone bars as, as per other arch tops. It has a pressed rather than carved arch top. And they were actually pretty good, but they're not, are they as good as a Gibson brand arch top? No, uh, but they are made by Gibson and they were pretty good. Uh, the flat tops also are so the top level Kalamazoo brand. So they're better than the typical Kalamazoo models, but they are still Kalamazoo brand uh, made by Gibson. And those are late 30s, early 40s. Um, Scott Richardson says, what types of picks do you prefer to use, both finger picks and flat picks? Question mark. Well, you know, flat picks and finger picks are so different that it's not a matter of which is better, they're different. Uh, most bluegrass and jazz players use a flat pick. A lot of folk players finger pick using either bare fingers or thumb pick and finger picks, or some of them use a thumb pick and bare fingers for us, for the rest. And some people actually will hold a flat pick and also finger pick. So you can hold the flat pick here and you can use these two fingers and you can still do finger picking. And that can work just fine. I've seen expert players doing that. And again, it depends on the type of music you play and just the techniques that you're doing. Um, so, that's, uh, it's purely a matter of personal preference though. So I think that um, there's, it's not like one is better than the other. They're simply different. That's like saying what's better, classical jazz or flamenco? They're different types of music and they each are valid. What's better, old timey or bluegrass? Well, neither. It's a matter of which you prefer. Do uh, you like blues? You like folk, you like classical, they're all excellent music, but people still can have their preference. And even within each of those genres, you can have quite a variation in technique that different players will utilize. And that's what makes this business so interesting. It makes it interesting to listen to so many performers. They're not all simply trying to sound exactly alike. Um, Joshua Abelson says, I'm looking at purchasing a 2009 Gibson L, 2019 Gibson L00 Walnut Burst. What is your opinion of this guitar? And the answer is pretty good bang for the buck. Um, and, you know, 
do I think that it's as good as the original 1930s L00? No, but uh, it's still a pretty good guitar. And I have uh, no problem saying that uh, some of the new Gibson flat tops are better than a lot of this, way better than what they made in the 70s. And in many cases, better than what they made in the 80s or even in the 90s. Uh, are they superior to the golden era instruments? In my opinion, no. But can they be a good instrument suitable for professional use or for serious amateurs? And can they be decent bang for the money? I think the answer is yes. And uh, it's an ongoing saga. Gibson, Martin, Fender, and others, Taylor are still experimenting. They're still coming up with new designs and the guitar has not simply frozen in stone as far as ending evolution. There's still new experiments, new models, new ideas. And there's also plenty of musicians experimenting with new sound. And back in the late 1800s, it was said that the director of the US Patent Office wanted to close it because he felt that everything that could be invented already had been, and they might as well close the patent office. Looking back on that, we realize how ridiculous that was to think. Well, music is not static either. There's plenty of new frontiers out there. We don't know where everything is going, but the fact is there's new guitars being made right now that are impressively good. Uh, does it reduce the appeal of vintage? No. Although in some cases there is a few vintage items such as resonator guitars, dobro guitars, and national guitars are the golden era vintage ones. It's bringing less money now than they used to. And most of the professional players are not using a genuine pre-World War II dobro or pre-World War II national. Um, there's a variety of makers Paul Beard today is making one that I think of as just a definitively fine resonator wood body guitar. National Resophonic is making some very fine metal body ones right now that are very much designed after the old ones, but the new necks are better than the ones they had on the old ones. That's not to say all new necks are better than all old necks, but in the case of National or Dobro, uh, the next being made on the newer ones now are better than the ones they made on those models back in the 1930s. Uh, there's one final question and I'll be signing off. Uh, what do you think happened to the popularity of the Ovation Acoustic and Acoustic slash Electric guitars from the 1970s? They were everywhere on TV and at concerts back then. Now you never see them. My first guitar is 1979 Ovation. 1111 Balladeer. Well, back when they first came out, Charlie Command owned Command Aerospace, which was making hundreds of millions of dollars in profit, doing government contracts and making helicopter rotors, among other things. And he liked guitars. And the Ovation Company was his play, play toy. He could put money in it, and it didn't have to be profitable. Uh, after he died, the heirs to the throne decided that this thing was a toy that never did make profit. Let's get rid of it. Also, early on, you saw lots of them because they gave them away as endorsements. So lots of professional players were seen playing ovations, but they didn't actually buy, they were given. Another factor, ovation early on had a pretty darn good acoustic electric pickup and nobody else had one that was as good early on at that time. And that made a big difference. That's one thing that did sell them along with Glenn Campbell among others endorsing them. But later Command started distributing Takamini guitars in the US and the Takamini pickup system was better. And that also ate into Ovation sales so that Ovation became a much, much less prized item. And today, 
most ovation guitars do not have good resale value. And, you know, we sell very few ovations, mainly because many of the old ones, A, don't bring much money, and B, a high percentage of them had structural issue problems that are virtually unrepairable or at least not economically feasible to repair. So their influence on the market today is negligible. We are not going to have a program next week, but we will the following week. So we're taking a one week break. So I'll look forward to seeing and being seen two weeks from now. But in the meantime, my personal email, george at guitars.com. I do read everyone that's addressed to me and I respond to them myself. I'm reachable. The shop is guitars.com, G-U-I-T-A-R-S.com. We're readily reachable by phone, 615-256-2033 or email. The shop email, gruen at gruen.com, G-R-U-H-N at G-R-U-H-N.com. So website email, telephone, walk in, we're open to the public. And at this point, the mask mandate in Tennessee is over and we are no longer having to do strict social spacing. We're still trying to use common sense, but we are open. Look forward to hearing from you. Look forward to being able to serve you. And two weeks from now, I shall look forward to doing another of these question and answer sessions. Look forward to helping you. Thank you and have a good one.